público. ¿no? All right. So, hello everybody. Um, our speaker today is Asahara de la Torre Pedraza um, from the University uh, Sapienza of Rome. Uh, and she will talk about the fractional Yamamba problem with singularities. So thanks a lot for coming and please go ahead. Thank you very much. I mean, thank you for all the organizers for giving me this uh, invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here or to be connected here, let's say. Okay, this is uh, really good for protection. So <laughs> let's start. I'm gonna talk about the fractional Yamamba problem with singularities and I will talk about different problems. But uh, so I will uh, try to focus on one special case, which is uh, I have done in collaboration with Hardy Chan, but I will give some hints about uh, different work that I uh, have done in collaboration with uh, different people, and I will say their names uh, when I present e each part of the, of the work. So the first thing that I would like to do today is give some motivation for studying this problem. So what is the problem, the fractional Yamaha problem, and why I study it? So if we go to dimension two, we have the uniformization theorem. So we know that any simply connected Riemannian surface has to be conformally equivalent to the sphere, the complex plane, or the unity. This means that we can transform it without um, uh, deform the angles into a um, surface with a positive uh, curvature equal to one or zero or negative curvature equal to minus one. If we put it together with the gauss bonnet theorem, then we find a conformal invariance. And in this way, we can connect the geometry and the topology of uh, any compact surface. But what happens when we go to higher dimension? If we go to dimension four, then uh, we can use the gern chance bonnet and the Q curva to divide by Alice Chan using the Panet uh, operator. And we have kind of a parallel theorem. But if we go to any dimension bigger or equal than three, then um, we don't have any, any theory which could be uh, parallel to this study. So the first thing is, OK, uh, can we transform our manifold? Can we find a manifold which is conformal to the one that we have and with prescribed curvature? When I talk about uh, conformal, conformal means that uh, we find um, a transformation that preserves the angle. And this is just to find a metric which is a, um, which can be written up to a positive factor as a pro uh, the metric that we have times this uh, positive factor. And this is exactly what the Yamabe problem asks. When we have a um, compact running manifold of dimension bigger or equal than three, then um, and the problem asks for a metric which is conformal to the given one. We write the conformal factor in this way, it's just a positive factor. We can write it as we want. This is just because it's easier to, to better to get the, the equation. So the to find this, uh, this conformal metric is equivalent to solve this PD that we have here, and we need to uh, find a function which are smooth. This problem has been studied uh, for a really long time, and it's known that if an um, unassociated energy function is uh, smaller than the associated uh, energy to the sphere, then the problem is solvable. And this is, uh, th this is true for all uh, compact Riemannian manifold. And in particular, we have the quality only if it's the sphere. So if we have a compact Riemannian manifold, which is not the sphere, then it's gonna be strictly smaller, and then the problem is solvable. In particular, if we go to the Euclidean space, this is when we have the Euclidean manifold, the flat case, we know that the only regular solution are the so-called bubble that have this expression that we have here. What happens if we don't have a compact manifold, if we have this sphere, but we remove a piece, then it's not gonna be uh, compact. And then um, I wanna know if the problem is solvable or not, if we can find a um, metric which is um, conformal to the given one in the sphere minus this uh, soft manifold. Well, under the scalar um, curvature positive, then uh, the problem is solvable. We are gonna restrict to uh, the case in which we impose the curvature to be positive. Uh, the, when, if we 
for uh, the curvature to be zero, we just have the flat case. If it's negative, it's a completely whole history, and we are not talking uh, about that. So we will focus on the positive case. And then we know that for this problem to be solved, the dimension of the submanifold we are removing has to be smaller or equal than n minus 2 over 2. Um, the existing in this case it has been proved, and also the metric has been constructed. So, uh, what is the problem? The only problem is that we need really to impose that this uh, curvature is uh, strictly positive. And um, this is a kind of really strong um, convexity assumption because uh, we really need that the uh, manifold we start with is um, convex. So what is what we do in order to not go to the negative case, but uh, like make it um, a little bit uh, weaker, let's say. So what we do is to define a different curvature, which is a non-local thing. It's something that depends on the whole uh, manifold. And it's uh, intrinsic and generalized most of the known curvatures. For example, we have a, uh, so we are going to represent it with a gamma that is a um, fraction. If we have it equal to one, we recover the scalar curvature. If we have it equal to two, we have the Q curvature associated to the Panate operator. And in the in case gamma equal to one half, we have kind of uh, an intrinsic uh, mean curvature, let's say. So uh, how do we define this uh, new uh, fractional non-local curvature? Um, what we use is, uh, as I said, it's a non-local um, definition. So we need to define a non-local operator associated to our manifold. In the, if we have gamma equal to one, I said we will recover the uh, scalar curvature. And uh, indeed, the operator that we will use to compute it is the, um, Conformal Laplacian. Well, that if you remember the 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 Yamabe problem in the classical case, this is the operator that we had here in the left hand side. So this is going to be the operator that we are going to define, and in the uh, case gamma equal to one is a local operator, which is the conformal Laplacian. But in general, for all the gamma, and we are going to restrict to gamma between zero and one, just to avoid technicalities. In general, it can be done for all gamma uh, smaller than the dimension of our manifold divided by two, but uh, let's restrict to simplicity. What we need to use is um, the scattering theory and uh, develop this uh, theory to uh, define the operator associated to our manifold. And uh, to give you a hint of how to do this, let's go to the Euclidean case, which is the easiest case. And in this case, we have that the conformal fractional Laplacian, which is this non-local operator I am talking about, will be the fractional Laplacian. So how do we define the fractional Laplacian? The fractional Laplacian, we have three different um, definitions, which are equivalent. The first one is given with an integral the differential operator when we have a singular kernel. The second one is given with the Fourier uh, symbol, it's operator uh, whose Fourier symbol is two gamma. And the third one, which is the one which is really related with this scattering theory, use, um, so we want to solve, a, or we want to compute an operator in Rm, what we do is we take one variable more, so we do an extension and we extend to one variable more, which is positive, and we solve a problem in Rn plus one positive, and later we recover the operator as a, a Neumann uh, derivative in the boundary. So uh, the scattering theory, when we have an um, operator, uh, when we have a manifold that has a geometry, what uh, does is basically you can, if you wanna uh, f uh, define the operator you need to uh, take a one uh, dimensional more, like uh, you have something which is like the distance to the boundary, which does represent this why we had before, and you have to do um, a resolve a problem in one variable more, and later take the Neumann derivative that will cover, uh, will give you the definition of your operator. So I will not go through too many details. I will just define it in the particular case we are going to use later when we use it. But just to give you a hint of why it's not local and what is what we, we are using. So the main thing that I will say uh, 
in general, for all the conformal functional Laplacian, is the conformal property, and it uh, gives the the name of the of the, of the operator. It's conformal, and the um, the main properties like if you we have two metrics which are conformal. Remember that we want to want to find a metric which is conformal to the given one. So we will use this um, conformal factor. Then we can compute the operator associated to one metric or the operator associated to a conformal metric using this equivalence that we have here, where this W is given by this uh, conformal um, factor of the metric. And when we have this conformal fractional Laplacian, how do we uh, find the, the fractional curvature? Because as I said, I'm gonna talk about the fractional curvature. We just need to apply the operator, which is associated to our manifold to the constant function equal to one. And then if we use this conformal uh, property that we have here, we take this function equal to one. So here equal to one and here equal to one. Here we just have the operator applied to W and here we have the uh, prescribed curvature. So we can prescribe or we have the curvature associated to GW and we can prescribe it by solving this equation with this the, the curvature that we want. So in parallel to the classical Yamabe problem, the uh, fractional Yamabe problem will ask for a conformal manifold uh, to the given one, or conformal metric to the given one that has constant fractional curvature. And then when we prescribe here this curvature to be constant, so we just put it to be constant, we obtain that we need to solve this PD here. In the left hand side, we have the conformal fractional Laplacian. Before we have the conformal Laplacian, and in the right hand side, as before, we have the critical sobel uh, power for sobel embedding. What happened in this case is the problem solvable. How can we solve it? Okay, or when can we solve? In parallel to the classical case, it's known and it's um, with variational uh, approach that if the um, Yamabe energy associated, the fractional Yamabe energy is smaller than the one of the sphere. And uh, then the problem is solvable. And this is known for all the compact, uh, um, uh, com conformally compact Einstein manifold, uh, assuming that we have positive mass theorem. So uh, assuming that the um, uh, the associated uh, representation satisfies the positive mass conjecture, the uh, problem will be solved. And uh, in particular, in the Euclidean case, it's solvable and it's known that the only solution are the um, so-called power. And we will focus on the uh, case when we remove a piece of the Euclidean um, space or the sphere, which are equivalent by the uh, stereographic projection. So in this case, when we remove a piece, we don't have uh, any more um, compact manifold. And it's known that if the uh, fractional curvature is positive under different assumption, the problem is solvable. And this is a little bit weaker than um, scalar curvature positive. So which are the assumptions? So in particular, uh, we need that this inequality is satisfied where this gamma is the gamma function. This k is the dimension of the subset we are removing. And we will work with the just a smooth sub manifold. If it's not a smooth sub manifold, I will not say anything. You will see why in a couple of slides. So, in particular, this is a monster, but we can say that it's satisfied if the dimension is strict, strictly smaller than n minus 2 gamma over 2. Then we can solve the problem when we have this uh, dimension smaller. But is this really sharp? Can we get something better? Can we get some, because in the classical case, we knew that this was solvable if and only if the dimension was smaller or equal than n minus two over two. So here we don't have the equal. And also do we know if it's sharp? So here's where my work uh, take place. Um, first of all, we construct the metric and we do it when the dimension is uh, strictly smaller, but also when the dimension is equal to n minus two gamma over two. That was not proven, even that we could solve the problem. And it's sharp. We will see it at the end of the talk. 
So how do we construct this metric? Because as I said, the, the, my main contribution is the construction of this uh, metric. I have been working on this uh, since long ago, and I have a, a lot of um, work. And uh, I have to say that for each, uh, each possibility, we have to develop new methods. So for example, when you have just um, one point, you need to use the what really means, so the geometry which is behind, and uh, what means to use conformal metric. And also you need to use some variational method to prove the existence of this metric. When you have a um, finite number of points, which is also zero dimensional, uh, you need to uh, apply non-local green method. We develop kind of uh, one of the first theories for this non-local green method. And uh, when the submanifold has non-zero dimension, then things get much more complicated. And if the dimension is between zero and n minus two gamma over two, we need to develop a full theory uh, that led us to do a parallel to the Matteo Packard program in the non-local setting. Uh, and when we have this the dimension, which is critical, it was, as I said, it was even not known that we could solve the problem. And this is because uh, we change, we do some changing uh, in the equation in order to get uh, uh, an equation with the serine critical exponent. So we need to uh, find completely different tools to solve the problem. Okay, so uh, for the construction, I said the uh, the basic idea, uh, okay, when you have just one point, I said you can do it with variational method on geometry, but when we did it in the non-zero dimensional case, we, uh, we also recovered the case of uh, just one point. So the basic idea for this, um, this construction is the gluing. So what is the gluing? How do we apply the gluing? Basically, the first step when you need to do gluing is to find a good approximate solution. So you need to find something which is not solution because if you have the solution that you don't need to do anything else, but it's almost a solution. So for us, uh, what can we take? The, what, uh, what was um, the, easy, uh, the easiest case, the model case? Yes, if we take, instead of taking a smooth manifold that has geometry, let's take just Rm. And let's see how to construct the solution that uh, are gonna be, um, are gonna give us the expected metric in Rm minus Rk. So in the, for doing this, uh, we need to find a um, fast decay solution, which is gonna be, okay, so we have the, the pure power solution, but since we want to glue, because we want is uh, to be a smooth and glue to the Euclidean metric when we are far away from the singularity, uh, we need something that decay faster than the pure power. So the constructive dissolution um, is the first um, step to, uh, find an approximate solution. But later you said, okay, this is just for the model problem. And I wanted to find a solution for my real problem, which has a sun geometry. It's not the, I am not subtracting the Euclidean um, subset. So what is what we do? Uh, we, we do is like, okay, we have some geometry, but we can uh, take a tubular neighborhood around our singular set. And here's where uh, we use that the, it has to be a smooth manifold because we need to recover with this tubular neighborhood. And then when you cut, what you see basically is like Rm minus one point, right? R in the like you are working in the co-dimension, so it's like you are working Rm minus k minus one point. So uh, using a Fermi coordinate, we are able to reduce our pro problem to the problem in Rm minus one. Point. Okay, so this is the second approximate solution. And once you have a, an approximate solution, sometimes it's easier to find. This time we need to work a little bit to, to get this approximate solution. But once you have the approximate solution, uh, this uh, gluing method, what says is like, okay, we have a function which is almost a solution, but it's not an exact solution. So we are having some error. We need to add a small perturbation 
in order to make this uh, function a real solution. So we have our approximate solution plus something that makes it a real solution. How do we find this, uh, this perturbation? So what you usually do is like, okay, you linearize your equation around this approximate solution. And then, then what you find is that you have, a, because this is known, you have the explicit solution, you have constructed, you, you have your approximate solution. So what is unknown is the perturbation you are adding. And then uh, you find an equation, which is the linearized, uh, uh, the linear part uh, applied to your uh, perturbation plus a nonlinear term plus a small error term. And then you said, okay, if I can solve this equation that I am getting in my perturbation, I find the solution and then I have the perturbation, I have the exact solution. So if you can, uh, you pass all of this to the right-hand side, and if you are able to invert this term, then you can, uh, if you have been smart enough and your approximate solution is good enough, and the perturbation is small enough, this is going to be a contraction, and then you can apply fixed point argument in order to solve the problem you wanted to solve. So uh, usually, if you have to, done uh, good the first part, this is uh, not a problem once you have that the operator is invertible. But what is the, the problem? So first, um, the operator could not be invertible. Then you have to project over the kernel. And the second, uh, possibility is that the operator is invertible, but you need to prove that the operator is invertible. So uh, for the um, uh, case uh, you have a, a non-zero uh, dimensional submanifold, and also for the case that we have just one point, um, we are going to see that the operator is invertible, but it's not easy to prove. So the main idea, or the hardest part is to prove that the operator is invertible so we can really uh, apply all this process and see that this is a contraction and everything. And here is where uh, the conformal geometry or the geometry or the, the, the idea be behind has to take place because uh, we are not able to do it using the uh, Euclidean space and the fractional Laplacian. And this is why I was telling you about this conformal fractional Laplacian, because what we are gonna do is like, okay, we cannot solve it in our end. So we wanna find a metric which is conformal to the given one in our n minus a piece. But if I find, uh, if I solve the problem for a metric which is conformal to this one, it's gonna be also conformal to, so the conformal property, it's transitive. So I can transfer to a conformal problem and solve the problem there. And this is what we are gonna do. So uh, what we do is transform our problem to the cylinder. And we need to uh, define and do everything in the, um, with the conformal fraction in the cylinder. Why can we transform it? Because as I said, okay, we wanna solve it in R n minus uh, uh, sigma k, we pass to are uh, a minus k minus zero using this tubular neighborhood. And then we can see that the cylindrical, uh, the, the Euclidean metric is conformal to the cylindrical one. And we can work really in the cylinder and use the conformal fractional Laplacian in the cylinder. When we find the conformal metric uh, to the cylinder, it's going to be conformal to the Euclidean. So uh, we work in the, with the cylindrical metric, but okay, as I said, the conformal fractional Laplacian is not defined in general. We just have this extension using the scattering theory that generalizes the, the extension for the fractional Laplacian. And uh, what we need to, to find, is it well defined? Can we really use this operator or is something that is in there? No, we, we have to give the, the expression and we could give uh, the three different definitions. So the first one is like, a, uh, and here is where the um, also take place that the, that the, we have a smooth sub manifold. And then when we do this trick with the metric, the, the this cylindrical metric, diagonalize uh, over the, um, and in a space is associated to the spherical Laplacian. So basically we can apply uh, separation of variable and uh, we can uh, solve directly the problem in the extension. So just imagine that you have the 
in Cafeteria Silvestre extension with some other terms that come from the geometry. So we can really solve the, the extension and give the definition for each one of these projections. Uh, then uh, we can apply Fourier transform and we can uh, find the Fourier symbol for this new operator. So as we have the Fourier definition here, we can also give the Fourier definition and I will not write the, the symbol because it's a monster, but trust me that it's explicit. It's a huge monster with a lot of gamma function. And the last definition, which is uh, maybe the most common for the fractional Laplacian, is the integral differential uh, operator. And the good thing, and why we this is why we could start to solve and we realize that this uh, cylinder was better, is because in the fractional Laplacian we have um, since in the, the right hand side we have the critical sublet exponent. Uh, this is not so good for variational method, but when we transform our problem into the cylinder, we have a new non-local integral definition operator, which is split in two parts. So we have here a non-linear term, you can say, oh, this is bad, we have a new term. Yes, but this is not so bad if the, is, this is just the price you have to pay to get a much better kernel. Because in the, the kernel behave close to the sing, singular set as the 1D fractional Laplacian, so we have an embedding. It's not a critical exponent, it's not critical anymore. And when we are uh, close to infinity, we have exponential decay, and this is really good because since we work. So using this conformal fractional Laplacian in the cylinder, instead of using the fractional Laplacian in N, we are able to transform our problem, which is a non-local PD, into an infinitely many system, uh, to a system of infinitely many OD of second order. And this lets us recover the invertibility of our operator and then do or um, the equivalent to the Matteo Picard program in the non-local case. So how do we do it? And this is uh, has some collaboration with uh, Wei Weao, Hardy Chang, myself, uh, Marco Fontello, so Maria del Mar Gonzalez, and Yun Chen Wei. So it's a really uh, heavy paper, uh, let's say, but it's uh, I, I like a lot of the, the result. Um, what they said is like, okay, let's focus on Matteo Picard. What do they do? What they do is like um, uh, using um, so we know that the solution thanks to previous work, we know that the solution are going to be radially symmetric. And when we use this radially symmetric and using uh, passing to polar coordinate, what they obtain is that the, the PD uh, will be a second order OD. We have a second order OD. We can uh, really control all the solution by knowing uh, this to solution which are uh, given by the initial root of our problem. This is uh, the solution which are just pure power solution. And we can uh, recover uh, the solution of the homogeneous so just using the behavior of this uh, pure power solution at zero and, and infinity. And uh, then uh, using some weighted spaces, we can recover that the only solution of the homogeneous is the zero solution because we uh, use the proper way to kill uh, the rest. So the only solution is a zero solution, and then the operator is invertible in these uh, weighted spaces. What happened in the non-local case? Why it uh, became so, so hard? Because you said, okay, I have a non-local PD, but uh, even if uh, I know that the problem, uh, I will work just with the radial function, uh, I still will get a PD because it's not local. So I will never go to an OD. So what can I do to solve the problem? What is what I know? What I know is that I can transform my problem into a conformal problem in the cylinder. And uh, when I pass through the cylinder, doing them the fuller chain of variable, the radius equal to e to the minus t, then uh, I find this uh, problem. So I can bound the, the potential, the hundred potential, like, um, my constant, the constant is going to be different, close to zero, close to infinity. But at, at the end, I can um, reduce the problem to study this conformal problem. And you said, it's OK, but you still have a non-local scene. And uh, how can you control the, the indicial roots to know how are going to be all your solution? Well, uh, the indicial roots basically are up to multiply my uh, complex uh, i. 
at the uh, poles of uh, our operator. So uh, our, um, if we try to invert, this is the symbol associated to the operator. We have a constant here. And then if we are able to control all the poles of this, uh, of this operator, then we can control all the indicial roots. And the problem is that, okay, we can find all the poles, but they are infinitely many. And the good thing is that even they are infinitely many, we are able to control all of them just with the two first ones. So we can uh, recover some similar theory. And why is this true? Because when we can try to, when we um, find all the parts, we can find that the first two ones are pure complex one, uh, it's sigma zero, let's call it minus one sigma zero, later, uh, so these are complete, we know that the two first are pure uh, complex. Later, we may find something which are, uh, they have um, complex and real part, and this has to be symmetric in all around. So let's try to do it more or less symmetric. I'm not doing it really symmetric, but just trust me, it has to be symmetric, something like that. And they are controlled because they are a finite number of them. And later we again get something infinitely many, but they are all pure complex and they are in a controlled distance. So they cannot really get closer and closer. There is a distance between them. So uh, basically what we are able to do using the residue theorem is like we can really compute the integral and we can give uh, an expression for the, uh, like a green representation for all our function. So we can really uh, do the integral and using this residuous theorem, get the expression for this green representation. And you could say, okay, but this is just one particular one. Why do you know that all of them are gonna be controlled in this way? And uh, then, uh, okay, I will not go through much through this because I wanna come back to Yamabe. But uh, the point is that we have some kind of Frobenius theorem and we know that this is gonna work for all the solution. They can be recovered in this way. We have also some Bronsonian uh, um, function. And basically this is because even we have inf uh, a non-local um, PDE, um, the solution is gonna be given by a infinite sum where each of the term is going to be the solution of a second order OD. So we really have the same kind of things that we will have for a second order OD. But as I said, I wanted to focus on the particular case of dimension n minus two gamma over two and why it was not covered with this uh, and this work, why we could not uh, um, study this, uh, this particular dimension or why it was even not known if uh, the problem could solve when we remove such a big uh, uh, subset uh, from the Euclidean sphere. So I said that the first uh, step was to find a good approximate solution, right? And they said, okay, when we have a, a, a submanimal, a smooth submanifold of dimension uh, smaller than a minus two gamma over two, what we do is just we restrict to the uh, when the subset is the uh, Euclidean subset of dimension k. And here uh, I didn't say too much about how to construct, but do you need to use the Kelvin transform and shaft methods of a different problem and later use some bifurcation, but you can really find this uh, solution that has this the decay, which is good enough. But what happens if the dimension is critical? We will see that if we pause this, the problem is not gonna be solvable because uh, we have uh, some kind of illumin theorem, so we have no existing of this uh, solution. And also, if you, do you really think that this, uh, the pure power could work to have something compared with this. Uh, so uh, we will see that it cannot work. And since um, we need to, this is just to study the behavior when we are close to this singularity, because 
later we said that we want to glue to the Euclidean uh, metric. So the importance of this model uh, case or this first approximation is when you are close to the singularity. What we are going to do is like, OK, let's try to do what we were doing before. So we cannot uh, go in the whole Rn minus uh, um, Rk. So let's um, just restrict to the ball, but with the same kind of trick of working in the co-dimension. And it's like, OK, if we work in the co-dimension n minus k, where k is the dimension of the singular set I am removing. And uh, you have to think that when we are doing this and going to the uh, co-dimension, it's like we are reducing the power non-linear linearity. So uh, reducing the dimension here is changing this power. And uh, when we have a k between zero and n minus two gamma over two, then we will have that the power here is going to be between the serving power and the sub of critical power. But when we have the uh, critical dimension, then we will have the serving critical exponent. So here, as I said, we have the fast decay radial solution. But here, if we try to use the pure power uh, solution, we get the fundamental solution. So this is not good enough. We will need some uh, logarithmic correction in order to get something useful. And uh, the most important things for us is like okay, we were using the conformal fractional uh, plasming in the cylinder, but um, all this theory was developed when we have that it was strictly, strictly the dimension was strictly smaller than n minus two gamma over two, and it's not working when we have this critical dimension. And why? Let's go to the local case and see why this case is so special, even if we have just a local uh, um, the local problem. Well, if you do the and therefore a change of variable, imagine that the, this is our n, this is the cylinder, but you can see it's just a, like a change of variable and forget all the geometry behind. So just do this change of variable. That is, the, you know that all the solutions are going to be radially symmetric and with this behavior. Then uh, if you want to study uh, what's happening when you are close to the singularity, you have to study when t goes to plus infinity. And then our, our equation uh, in the local case is going to be this second order OD that we have here. And we have here two constants that are going to be uh, positive. So this is going to be positive if we are below the sub level critical exponent. And this V is going to be positive if we are above the serving exponent. So when we had the dimension that was between the zero and this critical was OK because both of them were positive. But if we have now this um, critical dimension, then we will have a serving uh, exponent. And then this term is going to be zero. So we will not have this term here. If we don't have this term here, then um, the behavior is going to be different. Why? So thanks to uh, a work by Caffarelli, Hidas, and Sprague, or Hidas and Sprague, depending on the, if we are in the critical or just below, uh, we know that they, this, uh, they, they will have some decay. So uh, when we are uh, t goes to plus infinity, this is not going to be important. This is not going to be important. And the behavior is going to be given by this one. So the behavior close to the singularity when we are removing this uh, power is going to be given by the constant. But if we are in the case, critical case, where this is not here, then it's not going to be given by this constant because this is not zero. This is not going to be important, but now we have to control this equation here. And indeed, we are going to have that this was given by Aviles in the local case, that the, the, uh, our function is going to be, the behavior is going to be given not only by the pure power, but with this logarithmic correction close to the singularity. So we see that the, the exponent is really critical even in the local case. What happens when we go to our non-local case, when we go to our non-local case and we do the same um, change of variable, we know that this um, this is a critical uh, power is going to be here. And we want to study the behavior as t goes to plus infinity. And then we use this conformal geometry. We pass to the cylinder or whatever it's behind. We just transform our equation into another um, PD that is given in this way. Remember that I said we have a new uh, integral differential uh, 
um, operator when we have a different kernel would behave really well, um, but we get a new term. So what happened as was happening in the local case, this term is gonna be positive when we are above severing exponent. But when we have serving exponent, this is gonna be zero. So we will not have this term here. So all what we were doing, uh, studying the poles and everything, this k is gonna be zero now. So things are not gonna work in the same way. So uh, the first things we really need to do is like see how the solution are gonna work, are gonna behave when we are close to the singularity. And uh, just a bit of um, uh, spoiler, we will be able to do it starting a first order uh, um, ordinary differential equation. And I think it's the first time that uh, a non-local PD has been studied in this uh, way. So I think it's, uh, it's common for delayed uh, equation, but not for this kind of non-local operator. So uh, I will not have time to, to give all the details, but the, in, the, in the paper, we do a completely study for the problem. So the construction of the singular metric is just a, a, a part of this, uh, this uh, long paper. And we first uh, prove the existence of this uh, solution, radially uh, symmetric solution, because as I said, we didn't know even that they, they existed. Um, we prove uh, that uh, we don't, we cannot work uh, in the whole domain because there, we have kind of Liouville uh, and we prove which is the exact behavior, we will see something. And also we see that, okay, uh, for us uh, to recover Jamari, this is the important, but uh, why uh, we could also uh, construct solution which are arbitrarily um, with arbitrary which are singular in an arbitrary dimension. Also, Picard did it to construct solutions which are singular in the whole space. And also this kind of method has been studied to, to construct a Yamabe metric. But since we are not gonna use it, I will not go too much through, through this result, just to say that it's there. And then the radially symmetric, we know that the solution, we proved that the solution are radially symmetric, but it's just common uh, moving plane. So I will not give so many later. So let's uh, go to the existing. As I said, okay, we want to prove the existing of a, a solution that the, uh, remember that we have to restrict to the to the ball. So we want that um, has zero digit led condition. So it goes to zero as we approach the, the boundary of the ball. And also that it has uh, this power that we know that is in this way, the logarithmic correction, and we have the exact behavior. And some other things. And as I said, uh, we use a local, uh, um, local gluing. And uh, an important thing is that we use uh, an infinity spaces, which are um, much more easier than the usual LP spaces. So which is the, for this uh, non-local gluing, what do we need to do? First of all, we need to find a good approximate solution. So as I said, uh, um, we cannot use a pure power uh, solution. So we know that we need a logarithmic correction. And in this case, this is good enough because we have the fast decay just with the logarithmic correction. So the first term is going to be given by this, uh, this uh, exact uh, power. And later, well, we need to add some log log correction, but this is some technical thing that I don't want to go through because I think the talk becomes really, really technical. And then once that we have this, uh, and first approximate solution, we need to perturb it and find the real solution. And then, then we do the linearize, uh, we linearize our equation around our approximate solution, and we find the nonlinear term and the small error term. And the good thing is like, uh, okay, Hagi inequality give us that we have um, some range for this equation that we have, the fractional Laplacian equal to u to the p, there is some range between serene and sobolet where uh, our equation is stable. So uh, we are in the stable region for the mm, critical, for the dimension between uh, serene and sobolet, we were crossing this stability regime, so we could not always use the stability, but here we are in the stable case. So using this stability, we are uh, able to find a super solution and then using that our linearized operator is basically the fractional Laplacian plus the linearized part of the, mm, non, of the power term, we can uh, apply a continuation argument 
that go from the fractional Laplacian to our operator to prove that since the fractional Laplacian is invertible, also our operator is invertible. And later, as before, once we have a good approximate solution and we have the invertibility of the operators, if everything is done properly using uh, this uh, weighted space, we will be able to prove that this is a construction, uh, our operator is a construction. And then fixed point argument will give us the existence of the proper perturbation that will have the solution. As for the positivity of uh, the solution, we know it because it's a gamma superharmonic and we have maximum principle and close to zero because of construction. So we know the existence because we can really construct the solution. Why I want to say some words about the liberal theorem because there are some liberal theorem, but they need to assume something, and we didn't want to use uh, any assumption like uh, has to be in tier weight solution or like locally bounded. We wanted to do for all the possible problems. So what we did is like uh, uh, um, we have uh, our equation, and we know that it satisfies Harnack. So we prove a theorem, which we, we says if we have a solution in the proper space that we can uh, use the um, integral representation, then and, uh, we know that our solution, our function will satisfy some kind of Harnack, that in our case is going to be right. And moreover, we have a kind of... Um, integral inequality. Uh, so our function is bigger or equal to this integral representation in our n minus the ball, and it's positive always, then uh, the only possibility is that we have the zero solution. And to prove this, it's like, okay, if we have that uh, our function u satisfies this, then we do Harnack with the, we do the Kelvin transform, and then it's gonna satisfy uh, inequality. And using Harnack that is also satisfied for the Kelvin, we are able to see that the only possible solution is the zero solution. And uh, as a direct consequence, since uh, our, we have uh, our solution to our problem, uh, we know that this satisfied Harnack, which is just a slight modification of the Harnack proved by Young and so, uh, we are able to prove using the integral representation that this inequality is uh, satisfied. So our solution has to be the zero solution. So we cannot pose the problem in the whole R n, and we need to restrict to the ball with the right condition. And uh, maybe the um, part that I like the most for this uh, work is this uh, exact behavior. So, and also it's work for, I mean, you don't need to have homogeneous degree like condition. You can have uh, any degree that condition and you can also, um, uh, so the only thing that you need is that your uh, G is representable. So we can like uh, use the integral representation formula for the for the um, that condition. And also you don't need to impose anything. So for our case, we know that if it's uh, homogeneous, it has to be radial because we have this moving plane. Uh, but if it's not um, radial, uh, if it's radial, but it's not homogeneous, sorry, using this uh, integral representation, we will see that uh, we can just have some small error, which is gonna be eaten by the error we are controlling, and it's not a problem. And even if we have no idea that it's gonna be ready or we have nothing, you can just uh, use the spherical average and you will see that your solution can be approached by the spherical average up to a small error that is gonna be eaten. So we can use it for all the, the um, problem in this Way. And then, um, and it seems it's like uh, as uh, all the time we do this uh, change of variable, which is passing to the cylinder, or it's just a change of variable. We do then the for the change of variable, and then using the green representation associated to uh, our operator, we are able uh, using all the properties uh, that we know for this kind of kernel, um, we are able to control it by an exponential, which is uh, always um, in this uh, positive part. And then we have as uh, error, which is positive. And then this V is gonna be bigger or equal than this term that we have here. And if we realize this is just some derivative with the power of this uh, integral we have here, 
So what we really are able to see is that the behavior is uh, given by this first order uh, inequality. And then uh, since it's a first order uh, ODE, it's an inequality, but we can really solve it. So we can uh, get an upper bound, later the precise uh, asymptotic behavior using this um, Harnack and the lower bound and the exact behavior just solving at first order OD. And uh, this is not only for the fractional Laplacian, but this will work the same for all the non-local operators that has a green kernel, which is uh, um, asymptotically equivalent to the risk potential, and when the uh, solution will satisfy Harnack. This is uh, really important because uh, we are controlling the upper and the lower bound always using this Harnack inequality. But if we have uh, something similar to this and we have Harnack, then this uh, procedure can be used. And uh, just to finish, let's come back to, to Yamabe and see how do we use all these things that I said to construct metric for Yamabe. So in the, in the local case, why do, did we need to uh, do all this stuff and we could not really recover uh, like in the local case? So for the... Um, for the um, exact behavior across the singularity, this was done by Aviles, but he posed a question asking for a more analytic proof because he was using ODE method that we cannot use because this cannot be reduced to an ODE. We, we can use kind of ODE, but a different, uh, different method, no? not really solving a, a, an ODE from the beginning. And then in the Yamabe, this, uh, the problem was solved by Pakar, but he was using some LP spaces. So if LP spaces are really a um, headache, when you have local problem, when you uh, have no local, it was really, really hard to do in the, when you have this dimension between uh, zero and the critical. And so uh, when we try to do it with the local in, correction was really, really hard. So what we did is like, okay, let's try to completely redo the local case using an infinity weighted spaces because we have this hard inequality, we have the stability, we can use the tubular neighborhood and use just the asymptotic. And with the asymptotic, we could redo the local case. And uh, in this way, we could uh, recover also the non-local case using the same kind of procedure. And indeed, when we go to Yamabe, which is this equation that we have here, this is what we wanted to solve. You said, okay, I want this uh, the critical dimension, but I mean, it's a dimension, it has to be a natural number. If not, it's kind of weird. The only possibility is that we have gamma equal to one half and n odd, so all the procedure what works for all the gammas, but for us, the only important one is the one that makes the dimension uh, integer. So then what we need to solve is this problem here. And indeed, in this picture is, I think my collaborator Hardy, he's really great doing some picture. So we could construct using this uh, tubular neighborhood and then um, the approximate solution is gonna be the solution for the ball. We can construct the solution with the exact behavior close to the singularity, which is a mood when we are uh, far away, and that has the proper decay that led us to arrive to the Euclidean metric where we are really far away from the singularity. And here is just the, uh, since I am almost uh, over time, just to say that the only difficulty here is like, okay, remember that we are working in the co-dimension, so the error that will come is because the solution is going to be the solution in dimension capital N, so we need to compare the fractional Laplacian working in R little n or R capital N. But the solution is an exact solution, so there will be not uh, so much problem and the uh, glue method will work properly. Um, just to finish, uh, I wanted to, to make a, a brief of what uh, we have done. I and mean, it's like, okay, doing this trick of working in the co-dimension and can, like reducing the, the, the power, doing this change in the dimension. I uh, put uh, the ball because it's valid for all of them. When we have no critical dimension, then using conformal geometry, we can do uh, 
uh, reduce an local PDE to an infinitely many uh, second order ODE. When we have uh, the critical power, we have this ring, and then we could uh, study this equation uh, first with the local X term, which was uh, not known, and we reduce it at first order ODE. And also we could cover, co uh, cover the, the construction. So my question is like, uh, it seems that this kind of uh, process give us a new method that are uh, uh, developed using OD theory, which is much easier than using really non-local stuff. Uh, so, and each time we give one more step, we find new methods which are um, uh, useful, not only for this problem, not only for the fractional Laplace, but for much uh, more general non-local uh, operator. So uh, we are really interested now, and like, can, can we go further? Because it seems that each time we get some new method. So we wanted to really see, because we believe that if we find something better, like different um, dimension, we will find new different uh, method that uh, could be useful for a lot of uh, non-local operator. And indeed, it seems that the, for the local case, the the dimension is critical, but we have some hint to believe that not distributional, because we know that um, if the, the, we go below the serving exponent, distributional solution will not uh, exist. I mean, they have to be regular, but we have some hint and we are working um, to prove that there exists something uh, a little bit uh, so we can get uh, some uh, solution for the general problem, which are uh, singular in higher dimensional. So manifold. And now I am really uh, almost no time. So thank you for your attention. And that was all. Thank you very much.